Virtual reality. It's a technology that seems to always be the next big thing. I've held off doing this video on VR predictions of the 90s and 2000s because, well, it's complicated. By the early 90s, VR was at the peak of its hype. It's hard to talk about predictions because the predictions were, it's coming now, in your home by the end of the year. And this wasn't just a, a prediction from a select few in the industry. No, it was regarded as common fact. Computers in the 1950s and the 1960s and even a while further on weren't the most user-friendly. You had to either put in your punch cards or you had to, you had to type had to type things. Eventually, we got this graphics user interface, and it made it a lot easier for the average person to use. This made you feel at home in the computer, like you were entering the digital world. But some wanted to go a bit further. Because, see, virtual reality was a concept at this point. It wasn't called that, but it was the stuff of science fiction. As early as the 30s, we had sci-fi tales of glasses that let you go inside the dream world. Imagine being able to see, smell, touch, and maybe even taste a virtual world around you. This would have to be achieved with sufficient technology, technology that did not exist in any capacity during the 30s, but later on, it seemed a little bit more possible. To get here, it was clear what you needed to do. You needed a headset, a head-mounted display. It had to track your movements in multiple dimensions. The display needs to show off three-dimensional imagery in tandem with those movements. This has to be done fast enough to keep it, well, not nauseating. And finally, you need a way to interact with the virtual world world. But everything has to start somewhere, and our story begins in 1968. Computer scientist pioneer Ivan Sutherland showed off what is considered to be the earliest working VR set. Again, it wasn't called VR by this point. Now, Ivan was well known for his early graphical interface showcases, and this headset played well into that. You don't have any flat panel pixels, you have big old CRTs, and you gotta use mirrors to get them into the user's eye. Sutherland did not develop this technology any further, but conceptually, this was a breakthrough. It wouldn't be until the late 70s that something interesting happened again. Eric Howlett created Leap, this was an HMD, or optical display at the time, that would allow for a wider field of view than you'd expect. Originally, these lenses were designed in conjunction for a 3D camera system, but eventually that idea was scrapped in favor for, well, just the headset. This became the basis of VR headsets. Most of the technology that would follow would in some way be inspired or directly use this technology. But VR definitely did not exist by this point because there is another major issue. So in virtual reality, there's something to consider that isn't a prevalent issue in normal computing. Sure, you have to determine a user's head rotation in position, but also how do you interact with objects in a VR world? The solution would be a glove or anything that can track hand and finger movement. The first description of such a device comes in 1977 with the Sayer Glove. Its design is simple, but genius. So imagine a pool noodle. Imagine shining a laser through a pool noodle. As you bend the pool noodle too much, the light just uh, starts to dissipate. You can't see it on the other side, it gets darker, yeah. Now imagine that your finger is the noodle. That light could be used to determine how much your finger is bent, and that's how the glove works. Over time, this glove concept would proliferate throughout the early computer industry. A lot of people were interested and had various designs based on this concept or similar. One of these people was Tom Zimmerman, who was working on it in the early 80s before being hired at an Atari research lab. Remember that Atari did not just make video game consoles, they were still a pretty important player in the PC market space during this time, and the research they were doing was some pretty advanced stuff. Zimmerman met another employee named Jaron Lanier, and this data glove was pretty cool to him. Anyway, Atari was uh, going through a bit of rough things during this early 80s, and they closed down the labs, but many of the other employees went on to start various companies. Lanier started a company called VPL, which Zimmerman was a part of. Focus shifted to the data glove. NASA was heavily interested in the glove and began using it in conjunction with that old Leap VR. There you 
you go. That, that's kind of the birth of VR, separate technologies coming together. But also keep in mind, VR wasn't called VR yet. It would be Lanier, though, who coins the term, eventually. And Lanier is often credited as the father of modern VR because, well, he's kind of the first that brought it all together as like a singular product thing. It was a VPL system called the iPhone. Yep. It's the iPhone. Now this is an incredible piece of tech, especially for the late 80s. But as you can imagine, it was not cheap. It also wasn't particularly a great VR system by today's standards. Again, for the time, great, but uh, it cost about $250,000. It had a screen resolution of 240p. But at the end of the day, the biggest problem was computational power. This is an era before well, fast 3D real-time graphics. And as you'd expect, the VR programs that ran in this were about five to six frames per second. Future developments included these cool VR suits, but it wasn't long before the company went under. Lucky for us though, other products were being developed around the same time that served a similar purpose. Dr. Jonathan Waldern was doing extensive VR work. This was in the late 80s, but without massive fun. The results were, uh, so it's a headset that more or less functions as 3D glasses. There's tracking of sorts, but you have to move a big old TV around to make it work. These tests would evolve further though, and eventually the research would form the basis of a new company, Virtuality. Now, Virtuality is probably the most prolific VR company before the days of Oculus. When people talk about 90s VR, they're probably talking about Virtuality or something Virtuality worked on. This wasn't consumer grade tech, but consumer could use it. For these virtuality systems, you had to sit in a giant pod, and it more or less was an arcade unit. An arcade unit that reportedly cost over $65,000. The frame rate was better than the iPhone, but it was still sub-30, which is not ideal for any game, but it's especially bad for VR. The resolution was 276 by 372 per eye. Virtuality would find success. Malls and other leisure places would buy these units, and people were excited to play them, even if it did cost about $5 for five minutes of use. Pretty quickly, VR hype exploded. The news would report on it. Television programs would discuss this future VR world, its potential, and how it was coming to us very, very soon. The hype was real, as real as it gets. Interactive entertainment was progressing so fast that it was assumed that in a few years, these incredibly expensive VR units would surely be cheap enough to be in the home. This was bolstered by VR films, such as the incredible Incredible lawnmower man. Reality. We have no idea what he's gonna do. Is all in your mind. But it seemed like everybody was all in on what would surely be the next form of media to take over our lives. Sega was even doing its own research on this front, and they had a headset designed for consumer use. As strange as this sounds, consider that it was to cost only $200 and work on 16-bit game consoles. The games were mostly 2D, designed to look as though they could be 3D, but it's, it's, you know, I don't call this VR. I'm sorry. The refresh rate was 30 hertz, and they have two low-res LCDs that some reports say made the image just a blurry mess. As bad as all that is, though, it was hyped. Late 1993 was the release date, and it didn't come out. Right before release, it was shown by a research firm that the Sega VR caused massive amounts of motion sickness. Now, this makes sense, because if VR is running at a low refresh rate or a low frame rate, it will make you feel nauseous. Sega could have taken the risk, but at the same time, the American government was... They're doing the whole violent video games thing and calling Sega in to court and they just didn't want more problems. Eventually they claimed that it was so realistic they didn't want kids hurting themselves. 
but yeah, that's that's a lie. Sega did work later on a future VR headset with virtuality for a theme park attraction, and that did a lot better, but you know, we've already talked about this stuff. I don't even know if I need to mention the Virtual Boy, because this doesn't have head tracking and it's not VR, it just has virtual in the name, so not VR, I'm not even counting it. But with all this, you have to question, why did it just disappear? Why did VR go from on top of the world to never brought up again for 15 years? Well, that's because of how VR units had to exist at the time. You gotta think, they were more or less very expensive arcade units. A business would buy one of these things for a lot of money and hope it would bring in the cash. But arcades were dying in many markets by the mid-90s, especially by the late 90s. Console games just looked better than arcade counterparts by the end of the decade. This is something that had not happened before, and many asked why pay to play a game you don't own that looks worse than what you can get at home. And VR looked a lot worse than what you could get at home. They couldn't just update the existing units, they couldn't develop new games that would really push technology forward because it would always be outdated within a few years. As the arcades died, VR died, and by the 2000s, things were mostly silent. This was the era of HD, of pushing realism forward, and regardless of the technology, VR required frame rates and resolutions that just wouldn't be appealing to the average player. The market had moved on, or more likely, the technology just wasn't ready. But it would be ready, eventually. But that is a story for another time, probably next time. I wish there was some grand lesson from all this, but it really was the technology was just too expensive and not ready. The definition of a consumer market shifted from expensive things you could pay out over time to boxes, boxes in the home. But it would pave the way for something potentially great. So, you know what, maybe that's the lesson. Don't be too ambitious. Don't try too hard. Watch my other channel.